Hello and welcome to this talk on prisoners of war in the First World War, 1914 to 1918. My name is Professor Heather Jones and I'm a specialist in the study of the First World War. What I'd like to talk about in this in this very brief uh, introduction to prisoner treatment in the First World War um, is what factors define prisoner treatment, what was the typical prisoner experience, and then the importance of aid, the parcel system which was developed for helping prisoners of war. Now it's very important at the outset to emphasise that there were different prisoner outcomes on different war fronts. So if you look at the Gallipoli front, for example, um, or the front in Mesopotamia, what's now modern day Iraq, uh, British prisoners captured on those fronts had more negative outcomes. There were higher mortality rates um, than those who were captured, for example, on the Western Front. In, uh, as a general rule, the further east a front was in Europe, the worse the prisoner treatment. Um, so if we look at prisoners captured on the Eastern Front uh, by, by Russia, um, they also had quite high mortality rates, the Germans who were captured by Russia, for example. Western Front powers, uh, Britain, France and Germany and Belgium, um, did their utmost to, to generally treat prisoners uh, reasonably well in the war, uh, with some significant exceptions, particularly for Germany, which I'll be talking about in this talk. So if we start with the main factors that defined prisoner treatment, um, there were a number of key factors, uh, if you like, structural uh, uh, situations that, that influenced how a country treated its prisoners. First, there was the scale of captures. Um, some states, such as Germany, took large numbers of prisoners in a very short period of time. In the German case, in the first year of the war, 1914 through to 1915, Germany took huge numbers of prisoners, hundreds of thousands on the Eastern Front from Russia. It also took significant numbers on the Western Front. Most of the initial BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, sent to France, uh, most of those initially reported missing in August 1914, actually turned out to be prisoners. This wouldn't be the case later in the war when the trench system had developed. During the War of Mobility in August 1914, you were more likely to be captured uh, if you were reported missing. Now, Germany argued in 1914 that it was overwhelmed, simply overwhelmed by the number of captures it had taken. Um, and as a result, didn't have uh, enough barrack housing ready and um, enough prisoner of war camps ready. And many of those initial prisoners uh, spent months in tents or in some cases uh, in open fields while camps were built, uh, again, influencing um, their, their health and, 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 and also mortality rates. The belief in a short war was also a major factor. At the start of the war, uh, belligerents believed the war would be over by Christmas and as a result did not invest in building significant prisoner of war uh, housing uh, facilities or food systems because they thought that they, the prisoners would be uh, going home very quickly. Uh, international law was also a major factor. Uh, during the First World War, there was a significant body of international law uh, on how prisoners should be treated, which had already been agreed by belligerent states. Um, they had signed up to this in the pre-1914 period, the vast majority of them. Um, the Geneva Conventions of uh, 1864 and also uh, 1906 were in place, uh, and the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. And those stipulated how prisoners should be treated. The Geneva Conventions were very clear on how wounded prisoners should be treated, uh, and the Hague Conventions were clear on other aspects of prisoner treatment, uh, and in particular emphasised that prisoners should be treated the same uh, in terms of food and accommodation as uh, troops of the captor state's own army. Other key factors in prisoner treatment were the development of an industrialised uh, war effort, which was particularly clear from 1916 on uh, as massive munitions factories uh, were developed to support armies at the front. These required labour. Um, and again, uh, as agriculture was turned onto a more uh, industrialised footing to supply the war effort, um, again, prisoner labour became uh, in, important in, the, in, in, in this industrialised war effort, particularly in agriculture and in mining, uh, mining and quarrying. Uh, where prisoners were useful and in forestry where prisoners were important for, for producing um, wood which was sent uh, to, to the front uh, again to help make trenches and to, to develop um, and develop uh, road networks as well. Quarrying was important uh, for, particularly for that providing stone uh, for road, road networks. Access to food aid also mattered a lot. Um, prisoners who could get food aid uh, sent to them in the form of parcels had better health outcomes and survival rates than prisoners from countries that didn't provide food aid. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the third part of this talk. And then the other key factor was 
uh, the development during the war of a dual camp system in many countries. Um, we see this in the case of Austria-Hungary, Germany, France and Britain, for example, um, whereby from the middle of the war on, um, these states are increasingly keeping a large proportion of the prisoners they capture near to the front line uh, where those prisoners provide labour um, on front line tasks such as unloading and loading uh, munitions uh, which was actually against the Hague Convention. Prisoners were not supposed to work directly on the enemy's uh, war efforts, the capture state's war efforts, uh, but increasingly states kept prisoners of war at or near the front uh, to dig communication trenches, uh, to help uh, sometimes with bringing in the wounded, um, to, 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 to deliver supplies, unload cargo, um, keep roads clean, um, you know, remove uh, debris from roads, etc. All the kinds of, of manual labour that was happening as a result of industrialised trench warfare, uh, a lot of those tasks, prisoners were seen as a useful labour source uh, for them. Now, what are the numbers we're talking about here? Well, um, in terms of British prisoners in Germany, the total number captured by Germany between 1914 and 1918 is not exact. We have maximum and minimum estimates, um, but the, the, the overall estimate is between 175,000 and 191,000. The total number of British prisoners who died in German captivity uh, is between 5,000 and 12,000, um, roughly 12,425 maximum. So you can see there's quite a big range there in terms of maximum and minimum figures, but the maximum death rate would give us something like 7%. Um, so this is not the highest uh, in terms of prisoner nationalities held by Germany. There are much higher death rates for, the, for Italian prisoners held by Germany, for Romanian prisoners held by Germany, for example. Um, so it's important to put this in context. British prisoners in Germany, um, while they had, a, they had an, a significant death rate, it was not, uh, it was not the highest uh, of the nationalities Germany held. Now, the dual captivity system I mentioned, um, Germany developed this from 1915. It was, one, it was the first state on the Western Front to develop this, um, and it was developed initially for Russian prisoners, uh, which it moved from the Eastern Front to the Western Front as prisoner labour. Uh, British prisoners uh, and French prisoners were included in this process from 1916 on um, as a kind of pilot set of schemes. Uh, a number of prisoners were kept uh, from 1916 on. That system then develops more substantially from 1917 until by 1918. It's really the norm uh, for prisoners, British other rank prisoners who are captured, uh, who are not wounded when they're captured on the Western Front. Uh, from really March 1918 on, those men are kept as labour. Um, officer prisoners were still evacuated to camps, so there was a difference in rank in terms of who was kept at the Western Front as labour. Officer prisoners never were, um, but other rank prisoners who were not wounded when captured uh, were frequently uh, kept really from, from, from the middle of the war on and from 1918 on almost universally. Um, What's very significant here is wounded prisoners were still evacuated for treatment. So if you were captured wounded uh, and made it, uh, it, it to, to back uh, along the along the, 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 the kind of the evacuation systems, uh, you would be placed in a hospital and you would be treated reasonably well. The Geneva Convention on the treatment of wounded prisoners at the Western Front was largely upheld by belligerent states, Germany, France and Britain during the war and wounded prisoners were cared for in hospitals and largely treated the same as wounded men from the captors own side. So that was one area where the First World War did not descend into, uh, into complete barbarism. Uh, Britain too developed a captivity system. So it's important to point out this was uh, something that was reciprocal. Britain and France both developed it as well uh, towards German prisoners from 1916. Um, Britain started initially keeping German labour in, in ports in France to help unload shipping um, and using them in forestry schemes in France to provide wood uh, for the British effort on the Western Front. Uh, and then it started to keep them actually quite close to the front line um, uh, by, 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 uh, by, by the middle uh, end of 1916. And the French actually had German prisoners uh, at Verdun working on the Verdun battlefield. So all, all of the belligerent states were doing this uh, by 1916 on the Western Front. Now, prisoners in German labour front, labor, labor front companies, as they were called, um, so working for the German army on the Western Front as labour in labour companies, um, they were worse treated than prisoners in German home front camps. And that's really important to clarify. In a home front camp, um, you often worked outside the camp. You often worked alongside German civilian labour. Uh, you might be sent to work in agriculture as an agricultural detachment where you'd be living with a German family, living on a farm. Uh, the food was quite good on farms because farmers had access to, to immediate food supplies, their own, their own, their own, their own uh, livestock and crops, etc. Um, 
Whereas if you stayed on the Western Front as a prisoner labourer, you had all the problems of, of, of terrible accommodation, that you know, living often in, 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 in quite uh, in, you know, ruined buildings, uh, damaged factories, damaged school buildings, whatever it happened to be to hand. You were moved around a lot as prisoner labourer on the Western Front, uh, often exposed the elements. Um, work was very hard and, and, and most significant of all, you often weren't registered uh, with the Red Cross to get parcels sent to you, to get food parcels sent to you. So British prisoners uh, kept behind the lines to work for the German army, um, as I said, increasingly uh, from, from 1969, almost universally by uh, the spring of 1918, they had much worse food. Um, and they were also often beaten uh, to make them work uh, by frustrated guards who had to fulfill a certain quota of, of, of work tasks or labour uh, by a particular time period. So there's a lot of pressure on these men to work hard, on very little food, and their outcomes were much worse than British prisoners who were evacuated to German home front camps uh, where they benefited from better food and also from, so in some cases from leisure activities as well, such as orchestras um, or, or general, um, you know, better medical attention, etc. as well. And conditions in some German home front camps really could be very good. So here we have an example of Gießen camp. Um, and this is an image from a German uh, propaganda um, book, which shows photographs of the camp. And it shows the purpose built barracks that was the, the camp hospital. You can see in the center of the picture, there are stoves to heat the room. And th these are these are mainly, uh, mainly uh, uh, French prisoners uh, going by the imagery. And um, you can see French colonial prisoners in the foreground there. Um, and again, you can see the medical staff as well. Uh, Prisoner, uh, prisoner medics who were captured in the battlefield were allowed to be medical staff for their own men in prisoner war camps. There were also German me military medics as well. Um, if a prisoner got very sick, they might be evacuated to a civilian hospital nearby if it had expertise to treat them. So home front camps were, were generally, um, you know, for the period of the time, uh, once they were built in 1915, uh, could, be quite, could be quite well run uh, in, in Germany. So what was the typical prisoner experience? This is the second part of the talk uh, that I want to discuss. Well, at the moment of capture, the prisoner experience was very fraught. Um, it was not uncommon on the Western Front for a, a man to try and try and surrender and to be to be um, to be shot at capture, uh, particularly if uh, the units he was trying to surrender to had just lost a lot of men in a battle and um, had 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 not had the kind of red rage of battle had not quite dissipated, um, or if there was an incident where another prisoner rebelled, uh, a whole group of prisoners uh, could 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 be shot out of hand at that point. And the moment of capture was very risky, and um, there was a risk of beatings, there was a risk of arbitrary shootings. However, if a prisoner uh, was wounded and was actually taken prisoner, as opposed to being given the coup de grace on the battlefield, which also happened, if, if a decision was taken to capture uh, and remove wounded men from the front, they were generally then treated well. Um, likewise, once a prisoner was removed from the front, captured, um, the surrender was accepted, and they were then moved to what were called holding pens, which were slightly behind the lines where the prisoners were gathered in these kind of um, barbed wire cage areas. Generally then, from that point on, that prisoner was secure, they were safe, um, they would be well treated, they would be evacuated on, on, a, on a transport or they would be sent to a, to a, uh, to a labour company, uh, but they were safe from, from, from arbitrary, uh, arbitrary shooting. Um, during transport to Germany, there were some minor humiliations for those being moved to home front camps. Um, there would be German civilians who would occasionally spit at them or treat them badly. Um, this was a, mainly the case for British prisoners in 1914 when they were seen as kind of mercenaries who joined with France against Germany to the surprise of the German civilian population. This died down as the war went on and people became very used to seeing prisoners passing through train stations. Um, during transport, there was also often a lack of food. It could take three days to get to a German home front camp. Men were usually transported in, um, in, in, in horse wagons that would be used to bring horses to the Western Front. Prisoners were then brought back from the Western Front in the same wagons. There was often straw, there was often horse manure in there, they often hadn't been cleaned. Um, for, for wounded men, this could be very unpleasant. Uh, there was a risk of infection. Um, but generally speaking, transport to Germany um, to a home front camp was a better outcome than being kept at the Western Front as labour from the middle of the war. Um, in German home front camps in 1914-1915, there were complaints of mistreatment. Uh, there were complaints that prisoners were beaten um, if they refused to work, for example. Under the Hague Convention, it was legal uh, to put prisoners to work on tasks that were not related to the war effort. Um, and so in 1915, a lot of prisoners in Germany were put to work on marshland drainage schemes, which was quite hard work, um, and some objected. Um, so there was, there was a harsher military discipline. Um, 
One of the reasons for this was because under international law, again, prisoners were subject to the military law of the country that had captured them. And German military law was much stricter um, than, than British. It was uh, allowed for uh, officers to, to, to hit uh, subordinates. Um, so in the German army, this happened to ordinary Germany, German other rank soldiers. Um, and so they would also, um, uh, uh, officers, uh, captive, captives would also uh, be, be hit uh, sometimes, uh, beaten by uh, superior um, uh, uh, ranked German, st German staff who were, uh, who, were, who, were, who were in control of them in the camp. Um, from 1915, uh, we see typhus outbreaks uh, in German camps. Uh, we also see typhus spreading widely in Serbia uh, amongst the civilian population. We see typhus uh, endemic in Russia and Russian prisoners who were bringing typhus, bringing lice with typhus uh, into prisoner of war camps in Germany. Um, so there's quite significant typhus epidemics. And um, British prisoners are caught up in that in camps like Wittenberg. Um, and treatment is not great during the typhus epidemic and there's significant mortality. Um, from 1916 on, there is an element of forced labour and hunger in uh, some prisoner of war camps and also in camp working commandos, which are attached to a camp, uh, but which are actually um, based outside the camp. Um, so camps, um, if you were in a home front camp uh, itself, you often had quite good uh, living conditions. You were living in a barracks and you were sent out to work each day from the camp. But many prisoners were actually from the middle of the war sent to live on work commandos, which were spread all across Germany, sometimes located in villages, sometimes living with farmers, as I mentioned, which was a good outcome. Usually those prisoners were treated well, um, or sometimes uh, you know, working in factories where the conditions could be quite bad. Um, so some work commandos had hunger um, and, were, and, and, and were impacted uh, by poor conditions. But most camps had very good conditions uh, with a range of leisure activities for the major camps, places like Munster, um, you, you saw quite well developed uh, cities in a way, uh, cities of men developing in prisoner of war camps uh, where, where there were barbers, uh, where there were camp canteens where you could buy things, uh, where there's good postal service, so you get your post regularly from home, where there are camp theatre activities, so prisoners put on plays for each other um, and they're sent props from home um, or they can get also sometimes get costumes donated by the local uh, lo local people um, or uh, in some cases uh, buy them uh, from, from locals. So there's quite significant development of camp activities. Um, you also see orchestras in many camps in the big ones uh, developing in this period. There's also football leagues and football sport where prisoners play each other, particularly prisoners of different nationalities sometimes play football against each other in kind of, uh, in kind of um, uh, league games. Now during reprisal phases there could be quite bad treatment temporarily in prisoner camps or commanders on the home front or in labour companies on the Western Front. Reprisals were where belligerent states would uh, introduce worse treatment for prisoners temporarily to try and force the enemy to improve its treatment of their own men. So sometimes post would be stopped as a reprisal or parcels would be stopped as a reprisal or prisoners would be sent to work in very poor conditions as a reprisal. For example, in 1916, some British prisoners are sent to work in modern day Latvia in very harsh winter conditions um, as a reprisal uh, for the British use of German prisoners at ports, at French ports in France. Um, again, uh, in the frontline prisoner of war labour company system in 1918, there is a uh, very harsh, uh, very harsh treatment. Um, so again, that's that, that in 1918, we see that that whole system really deteriorating rapidly from the Ludendorff offensives on once Germany launches that final offensive in spring 1918 to push back the Allies on the Western Front. The prisoner system, the labour company system becomes very, very chaotic on, on the Western Front and prisoners really suffer poor treatment. Here we have British prisoners, 1917, 1918. Uh, again, this kind of trophy shot. We see a lot of those during the First World War, shots of prisoners uh, being taken by the captor side to show how well they're doing in the war. This is a pretty typical one. You can see a German guard uh, to the right uh, who's bringing the prisoners back uh, from, uh, from the front. Um, and obviously you had to, to send prisoners back here to use some of your own men to do that. So during intense periods of war, uh, of warfare on the Western Front, sometimes units would not take prisoners uh, because they believed it was impractical to send two or three of their men back with prisoners uh, back to, uh, to, to bring them back to the holding cages or to transport them back further. And in 1917, we have a very significant wave of reprisals uh, on the Western Front as the Germans start to, to, to use British prisoners really in the front line areas of the Western Front. So it's a deterioration in how they're using British prisoner uh, labour in, in the Western Front. And it starts as a reprisal in the spring. And um, again, 
in a, a, a reprisal that's aimed to improve British and French treatment of German prisoners who the British and French are using uh, in, the, in the Western Front war area. Um, the Germans want their men, uh, their, their, their men who've been captured, to be removed back to 30 kilometre distance from the front line so they won't be under shell fire. And as a result, they put British prisoners and French prisoners in a reprisal um, at, at frontline areas that are heavily shelled. Um, so, so that the British and French will be forced to withdraw German prisoners from working near uh, to the front line. This is a postcard from one of those reprisal prisoners um, writing home because the prisoners were encouraged to write home to alert the British and French governments to their plight. Um, and this prisoner writes just a few lines, which no doubt will surprise you and the rest of the boys to say I was taken prisoner. And I'm working behind the line through our government, keeping the German prisoners behind our lines. We are getting bad treatment until justice is done to their men, they say, so the sooner our officials takes it into consideration, the better it will be for us, so no more. So these reprisals didn't last that long. They lasted a, 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 a matter of kind of two months um, in the spring of 1917. However, they were effective. The, the British and French government started getting lots of letters from prisoners' relatives, from prisoners at local, um, local prefect or mayor, and from local worthies, uh, asking them to improve the treatment of German prisoners. And ultimately, the French first decided to remove German prisoner labour uh, to a distance of 30 kilometres behind the, the lines on the Western Front. And the British, realising their ally had done that, then followed suit. And this was a very significant development because for the rest of the war, the British and French never used prisoner labour um, long, long term uh, behind the lines in labour companies. They always kept it from that point on at a 30 kilometre distance. Now, they could do that because they were using colonial labour uh, right up to the front line. So they had replacement labour and they were also using Chinese labourers uh, in very dangerous locations. The Germans, on the other hand, um, after this reprisal, um, they initially um, reciprocated and removed the British prisoners back once the the, the British and French had, had accepted um, to, to withdraw German prisoner labour to 30 kilometres. The German government withdrew British and French labour, prisoner labour, to 30 kilometres and the reprisals ended. However, very rapidly, uh, Germany started to renege on this. Uh, and so by 1918, it's using British uh, and French prisoner labour, and particularly British prisoner labour from the spring offensives uh, of 1918. It's using them all around the frontline area, including in areas that are under shell fire. So it really very quickly starts to breach the 30 kilometre agreement uh, that has come out of these 1917 reprisals. Now, the 1917 reprisals also cost prisoner lives. Um, some of those prisoners of war who were then evacuated on the German side to 30 kilometres when the reprisal ended um, were, sent, were in such poor condition they were sent to German home front camps because they could no longer work. Uh, they'd been exposed to elements, uh, they'd been given very little food, um, they'd been, they really were suffering from exposure and hunger and malnutrition. Um, and some of those men were sent back uh, to German home front camps to recuperate and this is a notice uh, that, that um, from the from the uh, German uh, uh, general quartermaster's office stating that prisoners of war arriving from German labor companies in the front army zone are frequently in such poor condition that they die soon after delivery with a view to the present shortage of labor it is absolutely imperative to avoid further such cases and um, so very clearly and um, some of these prisoners were coming back from this, this the spring reprisals of 1917 to German home front camps in terrible condition um, and that, again, was a kind of pr um, precedent uh, for what would then happen in 1918 when British prisoner labour is used uh, in very poor conditions behind the German lines, uh, really from March 1918 on until the end of the war. Now, this brings me to the third part of this talk, which is the importance of food aid. And um, one of the things about the First World War was there wasn't really there were this a lot of this was very ad hoc. It had to be developed as the war went on. People hadn't really given much thought to how prisoners would be fed beyond what it said in the international uh, conventions, which was that the captor state was to feed prisoners uh, the same food it fed its own troops. Um, and this was supposed to be a protection for prisoners. Um, However, very quickly it became clear that that was inadequate. Um, and in, in, in the German case, what was very significant was by 1915, Germany felt it would be really abhorrent if its prisoners were fed the same as German soldiers were fed, while German civilians were starving because of the British and French blockade of Germany. Um, Germany decided uh, to, to break the connection uh, between uh, tr feeding prisoners the same as German soldiers and said in 1915 it would feed prisoners the same as German civilians. So note the change and German civilians are getting less and less food uh, by 1916 because of the impact of the blockade, which really starts to bite only from 1916 on. 1915, 1914, Germany still has quite good food supplies, 
particularly across uh, across uh, from Sweden, uh, coming in from Sweden. And um, by the end, by, the, by by 1916, um, uh, there's a very poor harvest that year, uh, and Germany really starts to suffer from the blockade, which is tightened, uh, particularly by the British. Uh, and from that point on. Link, the fact that prisoners' food is linked to German civilians' food is, is very problematic because German civilians' food is starting to get very, very poor. Now, the propaganda war on the home front really emphasised prisoner mistreatment. Uh, and this was a way of mobilising home front aid efforts to help prisoners. The propaganda war um, really focused on all sides on how badly the enemy was treating prisoners. There was no real discussion, for example, of orchestras and Munster camp or the fact that actually prisoners, officer prisoners were able to order really some quite fantastic parcels and things from Fortnum and Mason and able to get really, um, you know, uh, most of what they wanted sent by parcel from their families uh, right through to the camps, which was quite a remarkable thing, given this is the, the early early part of the 20th century. The systems of, of delivery were working. Um, the post was working through neutral states like Switzerland. Um, and, and there were actually quite a lot of things in the First World War about prisoners um, that, that did not show a complete collapse of, of morality. However, the propaganda war always emphasised the negative, it always emphasised prisoner mistreatment. And this, this led people to donate to support prisoners and help prisoners um, in, 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 large, in large numbers. So there were a lot of flag days where people would buy a little flag and wear it on their collar um, and the money would go to support prisoner aid efforts um, and all kinds of, of local mobilisation of, of, of prisoner uh, charitable organisations to help prisoners. Now, what was particularly common were regimental care associations. So each regiment would have its own prisoner of war care association, often with some you know, famous aristocrats on the board uh, trying to, to drum up support. Um, and these, these regimental care associations would send parcels to prisoners from their regiment. Um, there were also uh, regional um, uh, prisoner uh, support efforts. So there was the Irish Prisoners of War Association, uh, which was an aid effort uh, being run out of Britain um, to support Irish prisoners of war. Um, and, and again, with support from, from, from groups within Ireland as well. Um, likewise, there were, there, were, there were regional associations for Wales, Scotland, all, all of these different, um, uh, you know, there were different mobilisations at local level, grassroots level, sometimes at town level uh, for, for specific groups of prisoners of war. In the case of France, there was mobilisation of departmental aid com committees. So each French département had their own prisoner of war uh, support association who were sending parcels to their prisoners from their locality. And obviously the local link made it particularly personal for people who were donating aid, money uh, or people who were, who were sending parcels. So that was very significant. Women often led these aid efforts. They were hugely important in this. And, and prisoner of war um, aid, send, uh, either raising money or sending uh, comforts, food, clothing. Um, this was a significant area of First World War women's mobilisation. Um, often uh, aristocratic women uh, were, were, were kind of the, the figureheads of this or are sometimes very involved in this, um, but also at local levels, it, it, ordinary, ordinary women um, who were relatives of prisoners of war often took quite a strong role as well uh, in drumming up support. And obviously within families, um, mothers were very significant uh, in putting together food parcels for prisoner sons. Uh, and in, sometimes they would send you know, individual things from home. They would send baked cakes. They would send pies. And um, they would try and send these things directly to, 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 to give a home, a sense of home uh, to the prisoner. Sometimes cakes and tins did get there um, and were OK to eat. And that was obviously hugely personal for a prisoner to get a cake baked by his mother at home sent out uh, to him. Um, Early in the war, families did predominantly send aid, food aid directly as food parcels. But one of the problems with this was sometimes it took a long period of time, sometimes weeks to get to camps. If you imagine Eastern Germany, um, which is now modern day Poland, that's a very long railway journey for a parcel. Um, and sometimes the food arrived gone bad. And the British authorities started to try to work to stop families sending perishables or to try and get them to send, um, you know, send tinned food, things that would last. Um, so by the middle of the war, families knew increasingly to send tinned food and could also order parcels directly uh, by sending a postal order or um, sending a cheque to the British Red Cross in London or to the International Red Cross in Geneva, which would then pack a parcel for them on their behalf with food, uh, local food, and send it across uh, to their prison for them. And this shortened the journey the food had to make. And particularly for camps in southern Germany, it was quite practical. Food could reach there from Switzerland really quite fast. Now, the British and French governments also paid directly for collective deliveries of, of biscuit food, so uh, what we would think of as crackers, um, to their prisoner camps in Germany. And this food was sent through a massive aid organisation of, 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 of producing biscuits um, in Bern by Swiss locals uh, and in Denmark. And it was done in collaboration with the Red Crosses in those countries. Um, and this was done in a way uh, to, to, to kind of 
spare the British and French any accusations from the families of prisoners of war that the, the blockade, the British and French, the Allied blockade of, of, of Germany was leading to prisoners of war starving because there wasn't enough food in Germany. So the British and French governments paid directly uh, to ensure that these, prison, these, these uh, biscuits produced uh, in factories in, 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 in these neutral states were delivered directly by rail to camps uh, in Germany during the war. And this made sure that, again, there was food for British and French prisoners in those camps. Again, this didn't apply to prisoners who were working behind the lines as labour for the German army. They got none of this. Um, in 1916, there was an attempt by the British government and, and, and home front charities to streamline aid to prisoners of war. A suggestion was made that only officers should get individual par parcels from their families because it was clogging up the postal service so much through all these parcels going through. And again, some of them um, you know, hadn't got the right food in them, deteriorated, weren't wrapped properly, fell apart. Um, now, this, this suggestion went down very, very badly, as you can imagine, with the families of prisoners of war. They were furious and they also felt it was really unequal uh, that, this, that it would be allowed to continue for officers and not for ordinary prisoners uh, of war, uh, other ranks. Um, and this led to such protests, the idea was dropped. And so individual parcels continued to be allowed. Uh, but again, there was a huge emphasis on trying to get families to send, to send money and to have kind of professional charities pack parcels and send parcels on their behalf. And this increasingly became very popular as the war went on. But there were still lots of regimental aid associations that were doing that work at regional level. And um, so it wasn't the case that all parcels were coming out of London. There were organisations, regional regimental care associations at, at town level that were doing a lot of this as well and shipping, uh, shipping parcels from regional areas as well. Now, this is the propaganda war that was motivating people to donate aid to prisoners of war. Here we can see a poster, Red Cross or Iron Cross, um, and wounded and a prisoner, our soldier cries for water. Uh, the German sister pours it on the ground before his eyes. There is no woman in Britain who would do it. There is no woman in Britain who would forget it. And this relates to an accusation at the start of the war uh, that, that um, German Red Cross women in train stations had been cruel to prisoners of war being transported through on their way to German home front camps. Now, in fact, what had happened, there had been a couple of incidents of this, uh, but they actually, the women involved actually weren't Red Cross women. Um, they wore a kind of a, 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 they wore a red a red cross. They wore a nursing outfit, but they were actually part of German patriotic women's associations. Um, and so they they and, and they'd be, they 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 were reacting in a very xenophobic way at the start of the war to British soldiers, prisoners of war, who were seen as mercenaries who joined the fight against Germany when they should have stayed out and let Germany uh, battle France and Belgium alone. This behaviour rapidly disappeared. Um, it was a very much a, a kind of a start of the war um, uh, situation, uh, but it became very, very popular in British propaganda because during the war, badly wounded prisoners could be exchanged back to their home country. And there were reciprocal prisoner exchanges throughout the war, uh, whereby the very badly wounded men who'd lost a leg or an arm who would never fight again uh, could be exchanged in kind of um, tit for tat exchanges, whereby uh, the British sent home very badly wounded German prisoners and, the, and a certain number of them, and the Germans uh, would, would respond to doing the same. And these, again, these, these prisoners would be transported through Switzerland and they came home with stories of what had happened to them, which British propaganda could then use. Um, likewise, during the war, as the war went on, neutral countries, Switzerland and the Netherlands, offered to take in a certain number of badly wounded prisoners or prisoners who were suffering from depression or who'd been in captivity a very long time that was considered to be very bad for prisoners' mental health, and um, that a certain number uh, could, be, could, could, could sit out the rest of the war in neutral internment. Um, and the reason for this was twofold. The Netherlands and Switzerland knew their food supplies were much better, and um, so prisoners coming to them would get much better food than they were getting uh, necessarily in German home front camps. And it was also felt it was a benevolent uh, humanitarian thing for these states to do. They could offer this help, and it was also felt that these prisoners could then live in a more open regime because they would be able to leave their camps. They would be able to they wouldn't be forced to work and um, they could they could socialize. They could, um, you know, live, live as kind of um, as kind of uh, host ho guests of a, of a host nation until the end of the war. Um, so still in camps, but allowed lots of leisure activities and in better conditions than they would be in German camps. And, and again, there was information from these men back to the British government while they were interned in these neutral countries about what captivity in Germany had been like. Again, another element of the propaganda um, was, was kind of charitable aid images of prisoners. Prisoners were shown as defeated, as helpless victims, um, not as men who were kind of um, uh, who, who, who were themselves, uh, you know, soldiers and, and perpetrators of war violence, but very much as, as, as kind of uh, non-combatants, 
uh, men who were deserving of, of care and pity um, and who, who, who deserved, again, uh, you know, support of their own home front for the sacrifice they had made. Um, so here we see the Machine Gun Corps Prisoner of War Fund uh, here. Again, uh, this is illustrative of what is talking about kind of army regimental associations, etc., who were fundraising for the men from their own from their own units who'd been captured. Now, food aid really mattered. Uh, prisoners from countries that did not send adequate food aid, such as Italy or Russia, uh, the Italian state did not send uh, parcels to support its prisoners, only it left it to individual Italian families and it, was, it viewed its own prisoners of war as cowards because they had been captured rather than died on the battlefield. So the Italian state took a very ruthless attitude to its own prisoners of war um, and very few of the family parcels actually got through because there were blockages in the postal system and as a result many Italian prisoners died in Germany. The death rate was very very high, um, so about 100,000 uh, deaths, so very high numbers. Um, Russian prisoners of war in Germany also increasingly did not get food aid. The parcel system was much less effective. The distances were huge. Russia was much less well organized in terms of providing parcels and obviously revolution breaks out. Um, so these prisoners from Italy and Russia, for example, who didn't get food parcel aid had much higher mortality rates than those from countries that did send food parcels well and sent lots of them, such as France and Britain. Now, it was the capture state's duty under the Hague Convention, as I mentioned, to feed prisoners the same as it fed its own troops. However, by the second year of the war, Germany had announced it would feed prisoners the same as its own civilians. Uh, and that was a breach of the Hague Convention, and that obviously got worse as the blockade led to food in Germany deteriorating, the food situation in Germany de deteriorating badly from 1916 to 1918. So the prisoners were really at that point, if they were reliant only on food from, Ger from the German um, uh, camp, uh, they were going to get extremely hungry and malnourished. Parcels, as a result, made up the difference and allowed them to actually eat better than the local German civilians outside of the camp. And this increasingly became an issue for the German government. Prisoners of war were getting parcels that they could then trade. They could trade some of the stuff in their parcels, like soap, which had run out in Germany because of the blockade. They could trade soap uh, for, uh, uh, for, for, for extra food from, uh, for, or for extra goods, that, for, for anything they, they, they wanted to, 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 to trade, um, cigarettes, etc., um, with German civilians or with camp, prison camp guards. This whole black market in trading things from parcels developed. Um, soap obviously made from, there was a need, need to use uh, glycerine and fat and, and all kinds of uh, things that were running short and making all kinds of things like um, soap or sh uh, shoes as well from leather, all of these, any, any item that was made with any element, element of animal food stuff um, was running short in Germany by the, by the middle to the end of the war. Um, and as a result, any of those items that came in parcels were lucrative for bartering uh, for prisoners of war. A German camp food was very, very poor by 1916. We're talking weak broths, um, adulterated bread that you were using sawdust in bread in some cases to try and bulk it out. Um, there was barely any meat and there was a real shortage of potatoes. Um, so prisoners were really, um, you know, dependent on parcels and living off parcels. And sometimes men, when they arrived um, to a home front camp from, from, from the front, hadn't yet been registered as a prisoner of war. Um, under the Hague Convention, all prisoners had to be registered as prisoners of war, and this meant that their name appeared on home front lists for the British government and for the for, and, and also for the International Red Cross. So they knew that these men were there, and they could send individual parcels to them. And while they were waiting to be registered and waiting for that information to come through, which could take weeks, um, prisoners often lived off the parcels that were shared with them by their compatriots in the camps. So prisoners had a very sophisticated system of sharing parcels um, and of, of dividing up the parcels that came in within the camps. They often ran this themselves within prisoner of war camps. They were highly organized uh, British prisoners in ensuring that the, the, the prison parcel, the parcel kind of um, uh, uh, dividends were shared out evenly and the men in the camps didn't starve. Again, this didn't apply to labor companies at the front who were not often registered. Um, who went unknown in the final year of the war. They often they weren't registered because the whole system broke down in the chaos of the German advance. Um, and then the fact that German advance took so many prisoners. It took over 75,000 prisoners in the first, uh, at the first two weeks of that offensive in the spring of March 1918 alone. So it was were British prisoners alone. So it was completely overwhelmed. And many of those men weren't registered. And in any case, part the parcel postal system uh, to labor companies on the Western Front was completely um, uh, inadequate. It did, it was, it was, the men were moved so often from place to place. Their actual postal address was always given as a camp in Germany. So their parcel was sent there and it, you know, for those who were registered and it never reached them on the Western Front where they actually were located. Um, the parcels continued to arrive to German home front camps 
even into the German Revolution of November 1918, when the German state starts to collapse. Um, there was increasing theft from parcels during, during transport by desperate German civilians and also by people who wanted to, 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 to maybe bring that food and take it to the black market. Um, but given that the German civilian population were now um, in, in some quarters starving, particularly working class Germans, uh, due to the blockade, it's surprising how many parcels continue to arrive to home front camps intact with food. In other words, British prisoners in German home front camps by the end of the war were still getting their parcels despite revolution. We can see how food aid really mattered by comparing what happened to prisoners who did not get it. So what I'm going to talk about now are those British prisoners on the Western Front who weren't getting parcels. Uh, and we can see how they were, uh, what's the situation they, uh, they found themselves in uh, by, the, by, by, by the end of the war and how bad their food situation became without parcels. Um, here we see a, a prisoner testimony, Walter Humphreys, given after the war, where he described how we were always hungry. We used to pick a few mushrooms and mangolds as we cleared the old battlefields. It was repugnant eating mangolds, potato peelings, nettles and dandelions, but hunger finally overcame discretion. We became so weak that our legs shook under us and a march of a mile and a half fatigued us. And we find lots of accounts of these men desperately eating nettles, cooking nettle soup, trying to get some kind of nutrition because the food they're being given by the German army is completely inadequate. It's, it's you know, it, it's, 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 it's a kind of a, a it's mainly liquid soup and, 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 and you know, two slices of bread. They're getting very, very little actual food from the captor army at this point. In 1918, the deterioration is very clear. Um, here's an account from a German soldier, Frank Furter, um, in a left-wing um, uh, left magazine uh, from 1921 after the war, recalling how in a field lazarette, so in a, in a, in a, in a, in a frontline hospital, uh, frontline military hospital, um, I saw prisoners who, after weeks of work behind the front, were literally skeletons, lousy and beaten in a state of collapse. Hunger typhus, the doctor called it. However, he did not report it as this would bring nothing but useless trouble. And so it's very obvious that we've a lot of witness accounts. This, it's very people can see these prisoners are are are, are malnourished. Um, they have to be beaten to keep them working because they're so exhausted. And um, this deterioration in 1918 is very clear. We don't have overall death rates uh, because the German archives were bombed in the Second World War, and and those those files with, with potentially with information on how many of those prisoner labour companies on the Western Front died um, were lost. So we don't have adequate adequate statistics, uh, but it's, it's very clear from eyewitness, account, eyewitness accounts and also from a war crimes case that the British government took against the Germans uh, for, for very poor treatment in one labour company at a place called Flavie Le Martel. Uh, uh, they took it in 1921. They took this case against the German government um, for, mis for mistreating prisoners at Flavie Le Martel behind the lines uh, in a labour company there uh, in 1918. We know from that evidence that these men were in very poor conditions. Many of them had dysentery. The sanitary, uh, sanitary conditions were terrible in some of these uh, frontline labour company camps and the food was completely inadequate. And we know that many men at Flavie Le Martel died of dysentery and of malnutrition. Uh, so taking that one incident uh, gives, uh, gives an indication of what was going on more, more widely at this point in the war for those poor men who were held behind the German lines in 1918 and never saw a home front camp. They were captured often in the spring offensives uh, from the, the were from March to, 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 to June 1918, and by October, uh, some of them some of them had survived and recounted their experiences. Others had died, uh, but they never actually left the Western Front. They stayed there as prisoner of war labour for the German army. After liberation, again, an eyewitness account of British prisoner labourers at the front who had been kept by the German army there. Um, this is an account from the International Red Cross, which encountered some of these men um, after the war, um, when they had been uh, moved to hospitals. Um, it described intense anemia, extreme emaciation with loss of 40% of the original weight. The mortality rate is up to 50% of cases, very high mortality rate that. Uh, given time, rest and restorative nutrition of hydrocarbons and fats can ensure the disappearance of the edema swellings and a recovery. The prisoners suffering from famine edema that we have seen were employed for five to seven months in the army zone near to the front on heavy labour, constructing railway lines. During this time, they were deprived of any communication with their families and were unable to receive parcels. So just look at that 50 percent compared to the 7 percent maximum death rate overall for British prisoners of war captured by Germany in the First World War. And you get a sense of how different the treatment was with these labour company prisoners behind the lines. They really are a very different captivity to those who are moved to German home front camps where the conditions are so much better.
Uh, likewise, um, look at the, the, the reference to edema swellings. That's where the body is so short of food that uh, the stomachs have swollen, uh, the ankles have swollen, etc. Again, the French, uh, French witness here, um, this is the, the French army reporting the condition of, of prisoners they're finding as they move through the liberated areas at the end of the war, coming up to the armistice of the 11th of November. And um, this, this quote refers to the lamentable state of physical misery of the French and British prisoners whom the Germans have driven into our lines. These unfortunates are in a terrifying state of thinness and of exhaustion. The Germans have left them without food a great number of them have not even had the strength to reach our lines and lie prostrate in ditches along the roads in front of our front line. So these prisoners who found the German, German army retreating were left behind. Um, these labour company prisoners uh, immediately start trying to walk to their own front line um, and to, to, to get food. Um, and so these are the men who are being liberated now with the Allied advance at the end of the war up, coming up to the armistice. Here's photographic evidence of the condition these men were in. Again, the British had an eye here to developing evidence for a war crimes case, uh, which, as I said, they took in 1921 uh, against the German, uh, uh, German, the German army of the First World War uh, and the German government of, that, of, the, war, of the wartime period. Um, here we see that they, that they pushed the watch on the man um, who, uh, up, up, up his arm to show how thin he is. So you can see from the watch in the photograph uh, just how thin he is. And they've placed a healthy man's arm next to the emaciated arm to show again how thin and ill this man is. Um, this is uh, from the Imperial War Museum. This image is, is kept in the Imperial War Museum. Um, and the original caption is, freed from starvation and inhuman treatment, Private Thompson of the Durham Light Infantry, who was reduced to this helpless state through bad and insufficient food and overwork. He was employed in tree felling, which was used for railway sleepers behind the German lines. And it's the 25th of October 1918 that this image uh, has, has, has been taken. Now, we don't know much about prisoners of war. They're not a huge part of how the public remembers the First World War. The focus is very much on Western Front combat. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why prisoners of war were ultimately forgotten. And all of this story I've just told you wasn't, didn't become part of public memory of the war. Um, one reason was the impact of the Second World War and its hor horrendous camps, particularly its concentration camps in the Holocaust. Um, but this really overshadowed the history of First World War prisoner mistreatment. Um, another, another factor was that British prisoner veterans uh, didn't mobilise into prisoner war veterans lobby. They joined the British Legion like everybody else. There was no separate uh, organisation for prisoner veterans. Um, there was just the one, uh, one organisation ultimately by the middle of the 1920s, which really focused on all soldiers as, as equal. So the idea of separate prisoner history uh, got, got amalgamated into the overall combat history of the war. There's also a, a, a fact that most memoirs of, of captivity were written by officers. And officers have had a completely different captivity experience to other ranks. As I mentioned, they were always evacuated from the Western Front. They were never labourers at the Western Front um, as prisoners. They were always moved to officer prisoner of war camps as well. They were never in the same camps in Germany on the home front with, with, uh, as other rank prisoners. They were removed from their men and they were sent, uh, evacuated from the Western Front on capture to officer prisoner of war camps where conditions were much, much better uh, than they were in the other rank home front camps or in the much worse prisoner of war labour companies behind the lines. And the memories that were uh, written down were memoirs by officers. So they had a, a very distorting effect on the memory of captivity because they were presenting a much, much better treatment and, and in many ways a happier captivity, a more comfortable captivity um, than, than, than that that had happened to the vast majority of British men who were actually captured during the First World War. Um, and another factor in, in the 1920s and 30s was that um, interwar British policy started to move increasingly towards reconciliation with Germany. And remembering the mistreatment of prisoners of war really wasn't helpful to that. Uh, so again, there was this kind of silencing and this focus on the officer's history of captivity, which was much more of a kind of shared experience that could be uh, show, show, you know, could kind of show um, uh, uh, comradeship and in some cases even uh, camaraderie uh, with, with German guards. Uh, so compared to compared to uh, compared to the history of the other ranks, who've been so in some cases quite badly treated uh, in labour companies, this didn't fit with the reconciliation political needs of the interwar. So conclusions uh, on captivity, just to end here on what we need to think about when we think about First World War prisoner of war captivity. Well, the First World War established a norm that prisoners of war would be fed from parcels rather than by the captor state. And that was quite problematic going into the Second World War because that norm actually assumed that it would be more the home front that would feed the prisoners rather than the belligerent state. And of course, 
by the Second World War, it became incredibly difficult to get parcels around uh, camps and to get even to get to, to get parcels into camps. Um, and it also uh, removed or uh, uh, kind of started to undermine that idea that actually capture states are responsible for feeding prisoners. And in the case of Nazi Germany, which chose not to feed uh, large numbers of its Soviet prisoners, millions of Soviet prisoners of war died uh, in, in German captivity in the Second World War of hunger, deliberate, a deliberate policy of annihilation and starvation introduced by the Nazi regime for racial reasons. Um, you can see how this, this this undermining coming out of the First World War of the idea that the, the belligerent states must feed their prisoners and must feed them well to the same standard as their own troops was actually problematic. Um, sticking to that universal obligation, in other words, um, would have would have set a better a better precedent uh, than suggesting that actually somehow it's the home country's business to feed their prisoners. Um, the war also undermined the idea of a standard universal treatment for all prisoners. I mentioned how different the mortality rates for prisoners were for prisoners who got parcels in prisoner nationalities that didn't. Um, this again started to create the idea that some prisoners were kind of more worthy of care than other prisoners of other nationalities. And again, international law had assumed all prisoners would be treated equally, universally, regardless of nationality. The Hague Convention, the Geneva Convention um, were, were supposed to apply to any state that had signed up to them. But this was not what happened uh, as, as World War I went on. Um, and some prisoners were starving uh, because they weren't getting parcels and other prisoner nationalities were not starving because they were. Um, and so the war starts to undermine this idea that all prisoners should be treated equally. The war memory in Germany was also very problematic because the First World War created this kind of myth that Germany, while suffering from the blockade and with its own, its own civilians starving or malnourished, had somehow wasted food on prisoners of war, that even the very rather rubbish food that Germany was giving prisoners by 1917 and 1918, that this was somehow a waste, that actually Germany should have focused on feeding its own civilians and its own army, and that feeding prisoner mouths um, was, 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 was a waste of food. Now, this led to a much more ruthless attitude towards forced labour in military circles in planning for future wars, particularly once Nazism comes in as, as, as an ideology which really prioritised kind of, uh, prioritise an idea of the German races above all others. Um, the, the, the reality was in World War One, Germany got a lot of work out of its prisoner labourers on the home front and, and, and at, at the front line, which actually was a factor in enabling Germany to continue the war as long as it did, particularly if you look at areas like the Ruhr, the Ruhr mines um, and the amount of work prisoners were doing there, large numbers of prisoners working there. And, and the fact that they had they needed to be fed was significant in sustaining that labour resource. Um, however, by the interwar period, the Nazi thinking was that actually prisoner labourers should simply be worked until they dropped and then replaced with other prisoner labour. That prisoner labour was somehow an expendable resource that you could continue to renew with new prisoners from the front um, and you shouldn't really focus on feeding well. Um, very, very dangerous ideas developing out of the memory of World War I captivity in Germany. And the idea that it had somehow wasted food that should have gone to German civilians. The war also led to new military assumptions um, about about prisoner of war labour on the Western Front, which also feature into this um, this idea again that you see in 1918 of. British prisoner labour, French prisoner labour on the Western Front, um, not being well fed by the German army, being beaten, um, you know, going, suffering the kind of malnutrition we just saw in that photograph I showed. And um, this kind of normalises the idea that prisoner labour can be treated like that. And again, that's a very disturbing um, normalisation that's never really challenged in interwar Germany. Um, and that again, you then see that kind of forced labour, um, starvation labour um, being more widespread uh, in, in, in the Second World War. And finally, the First World War created this template of the modern prisoner of war camp. Um, yes, there were leisure activities, orchestras, uh, theatre, um, there, were, there were canteens, there were civilian workers sometimes that came in from outside and sold things in camps and took photographs in camps and sold the photographs of the prisoners back to them so they could send a postcard photograph of themselves to their family at home. Yes, there were those good things, but the war also created a kind of security template of the modern camp as a kind of totally secure space in which, it, in which prisoners were dangerous and had to be segregated from the home front population. Um, so we get the template in Germany of, of the camp with floodlights to prevent escapes, sentry towers, guard dogs, barbed wire and electric fences to stop prisoners escaping. Now those, that kind of infrastructure is the kind of infrastructure that is then reused in the Second World War. So this idea of the modern prisoner of war space as a security space um, and a totalised security space is also one of the most disturbing legacies of First World War captivity. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I've been uh, Professor Heather Jones um, and I've been talking to you about prisoner of war treatment in the First World War. <laughs>